Now's your chance to, um, to share or ask questions. Yes, Doris. I think this conversation will, will hopefully resonate and, and elevate the conversation and awareness and acceptance. Because again, I think um, men feel reluctant to deal with women's issues. I think a lot of women are reluctant to deal with women's issues. And so there's just reluctance around everywhere. So. Around feminism and, exactly. and to elevate it into something right. that's more unified. So this is awesome. But again, you know, you're wanting to know about how to get it in the, uh, the political realm. So please, I would like to know how to help you do that and how we can get it into that next next phase. Right, to eradicate awesome. that polarization that happens around the subject, for sure. Do you want to speak to that? Is there anything you want to say, or should I just ask, take another question? I would, no, I would love ideas. Ideas, okay. <laughs> Anybody has ideas? Yes, Robin. I was just wondering if you had any theories on um, what happens after college. Because to me, it seems like there's so many bright girls. I mean, I have kids. They went through college, girls and boys. Usually the girls were the valedictorians, and yeah. they're just amazing. And almost every college, 50% girls, 50% boys. And so they rise all the way through college, and then they graduate, and then something changes. And I was just wondering if, I mean, obviously a lot of them have children, and that, that is part of the equation, but there seems to be something much, much more than that happening. And I was just wondering if you had any theories on that. Well, clearly, I mean, you guys have all read, probably read Anne Marie Slaughter's piece, which was, you know, inc I thought incredible in The Atlantic, but I think she touched on a nerve about this lack of, of partnership and, you know, finding the right partners that are going to kind of be with you, you know, through, through everything. And I think you have to think about this as a, as a long journey and find ways that you're going to find someone that's going to be supportive. Your advocate. Yeah, your advocate. And I think that's part of this whole thing about what I worried about. I said earlier about millennials trying to go into these, these organizations and the organizations don't change and they're going to be the same old thing. But I, I remain hopeful, and that's why my whole focus on this is to prize these traditional traits that, let's just be candid, they've been undervalued because they've been associated um, as not being part of business. Too squishy. Too squishy, too soft, you know? And this stuff has got a hard-edged ROI to it. Yes. Um, so I, I think that's a, a critical part to this. Yeah, and if I can just address that, it's, it, 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 Cheryl's book was good to point this out too, that the likability factor for women who are successful is, is not correlated. Yeah, exactly. So that with men, they're very, they're, let's say they're aggressive, they're considered leader-like. Women are considered the B word. And, and so it's a, it's a cultural and societal uh, shift that we have to make. And by prizing these qualities, I think that's part, yeah. that's part of it. But also, um, you know, it's how we showcase smart girls. It's how we brand what a popular girl is and how, and the investment that we make into having, you know, Dove, for instance, they're doing great commercials, you know, and different commercials that really change the way, you know, just change the way we dumb down our girls and make it look like you're popular if you're pretty, you know? So isn't that part, part of it? Yeah. Okay, who else? Yes, over here. Have you done any statistical information on girls that go to same-sex schools through high school and if they translate into better jobs, higher up on the economic chain? Only qualitative. My, uh, my wife went to all-girls Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she's kicking booty at Estee Lauder. She's got a, a great all job. Right. Um, no, no, I haven't. I think that I wonder if, if others have have done that. And I think that's part, again, of this discussion. If we prize in the workplace and in politics these traits, it's going to hopefully sort of allow more people to sort of have a... a Is that more freedom with the math and the sciences, which is what I... Was totally. You know, you know, one of the things we have in the, in the book is an interview at the um, Agalia Preschool, which is the first genderless preschool in the world, gender neutral. What was really interesting is that they've just tried to get rid of any sort of biases oh. that you would naturally apply Stereotype. to boys and girls. Right. 
she talked about some girls are really tough and they don't need all this coddling and some boys are so sensitive you've got to hug them and you've got to make them feel good and you know most preschools would just go you're this and you're that and their whole goal kind of tied to Sir um, wow. Ken Robinson's talk about it, how yes. it you know, kills creativity. Yes. That's her whole point, is that you've got kids, they're four years old, it's the most expansive time of your development of your brain, and to be sort of put in a box by gender is just an argument against their creativity. Yeah. Where is it? It's in Stockholm. Yeah, it's incredible. Wow. John, I'm fascinated by the study in Lima, Peru, where that woman was able to prove that by bringing women into the police force, the corruption went down. Yeah. Do you have more of that data? I think it would apply in Washington. I think we could yeah. really use those yeah. numbers. I'm, I'm yeah. serious about this. There's, Do you have more data on that? You can get more probably off of our website. I think we might have attachments. We're trying to hyperlink as many of these stories as we can. That's great. You can also Google her. She's sort of a, a superstar down in in Lima, she and Catalina in, in Medellin are just two of the strongest women I've ever met in my life. Hi, thank you for bringing this forward to us. I was wondering, as you were interviewing and talking to these people who had used their feminine powers to be successful, what did you learn about how they used their feminine powers to work through um, existing structures that were very male-dominated? Yeah. And I ask this because that's, of course, where a lot of us sit today. Right. Uh, I, I would say a lot of them, the same way that we would talk about, you know, what is a great innovator, an innovator looks at the world and sees it differently. They, a lot of them, had the courage. They had the courage to, to be themselves. And again, that's a constant theme. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maddish was being himself. He's just this curious, sort of quirky guy who just puts it out there. Like, you knew everything about his life in about you know, 10 minutes of spending time with him. And yet, he had this hard-driven belief that scientists needed to be more efficient. So you know, he was going at a problem with a purpose, but he was just being himself. And I think that's one way to sort of challenge these things. And I think that's, again, why we're trying to tie the book into progress and prosperity and innovation to reward these behaviors and to have companies and institutions realize you're not just being, you know, um, soft, you're, you're being hard. The other thing about um, Maddish, real quickly, he taught me a really interesting lesson. Um, you can't open up a business book right now without learning for, from failure. All these articles, there's like a gazillion TED Talks on them now. Okay. What he taught me was there'd be less failing if we admitted what we didn't know in the first place. That's it right there. That, that, that's it right there, and I would just tag on to that in terms of when you're in these situations that you think don't permit or allow you to be the way you're, you want to be, that's, that's the, that is the wall, that idea. Because what we've seen over and over again is vulnerability and transparency have power. So just like he's ta you're talking about with the guy saying, I don't know what I don't know, it's really, if you think about people you're attracted to and that you consider to be charismatic, they're people who create intimacy. And the way you create intimacy is into me you see. You let people in. So it takes a lot of bravery because we've been told that we have to have these personas in life that are different than who we are so that we can protect ourselves. But the truth is real power, feminine power, comes from creating that intimacy between you and other people by sharing yourself warts and all. So I would just, that's underlining what you said Absolutely. and saying it in another way. Yes. Well, you had asked about what we can do in politics. I, uh, I'm Benita Banducci, and I teach gender and engineering at Santa Clara University in the graduate program. So if we can talk to engineers, I think we can make a difference in politics. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've found that we need to create language that can be listened to in what I call the more individualistic culture mm. of men and in language. And, uh, one of the things is to talk about relational competencies rather than feminine. We all, it's, it's fine for us to talk feminine, but most men really are going to run from the word feminine. So yeah. I talk about relational competencies. And instead of traits, competencies, because the guys can't get their hands. The guys coming from a culture of skills and um, objects and action can't get their hands on traits 
but they can get their hands on competencies. Mm -hmm. I actually have interviewed men who, who have said women aren't ready yet because they're all over the place. They're kind of scattered and all over the place. They're reframing, right? Because they're not, they're interpreting it through their lens rather than, which is highly focused, rather than being able to see the connecting the dots skill and the system's way of thinking. And a nonlinear way of communicating. Yeah. Right. Barbara Boxer recently said, you know, women are interested in the softer things or softer issues. It's time that we turn soft into action, uh, to competencies, uh, to identify yeah. them. I, I know even just saying that women bring different set of competencies to the same issues. I realize that some of our strongest people still don't have the language. Mm -hmm. uh, and it needs to be translated for the guys, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. That's yeah. good. So, Thank you. Very yeah, good. really good point, okay. Bonita. Thank you. Very good. OK, who else has a question or a share? Yes, go I ahead. would just like to add the term gender representation to the common vernacular. I think that should be our war cry, <laughs> so to speak. What do you mean by that? That means that um, gender representation, like for polit political, um, there should be at least 50% women in Congress. Mm -hmm. And even if we have to Absolutely. have an amendment to the Constitution, I think it's really important. <laughs> yeah, you know? I'm for there you. There should be gender representation at all levels of business, yeah. all levels of corporate, yeah. all levels of politics. Yes. And then we would change. You know, once the feminine get their numbers, then we won't be hybrid males anymore. You know, right. then we'll reach our numbers and then we will really start networking and then we can see what the feminine can do. Awesome. Right, right, thank you. Yeah. So gender representation, tell all your friends. 50-50 by 2020. I like that. That's very good. Let's pass that. To Benita's point, um, you know, soft is a very strange adjective to use. It just doesn't sit well with me at all. But, um, fierce compassion is something that I've seen used in um, in goddess culture. You know, goddesses are talked you know talked about in terms of compassion and ferocity, yes. but not violence or aggression. Right. But this sort of blending of yeah. strength, power, you know, and and true empathy, stepping out of oneself and right. feeling what it might be like to be somebody else. I met John at South by Southwest. And um, we started talking afterwards about this gender neutral yeah. business. Yeah. More recently, I've, I realized, you know, I just pulled a t-shirt out of my drawer the other day. And it was from Southeast Asia where there's this motto, wherever you go, you see same, same, but different. Right? And I was just like, what is same, same, but different? And people would say, oh, it's, you know, it's the name of a bar. It's the name. And I was like, but what does it mean? You know, and what I realized recently that it means is that um, equality is, is half the truth and the other half is difference. Part of the reason we're in the predicament we are as a, as a society, as a, as a race, is that we are not valuing the feminine as much as we do the masculine. Right. So um, to neutralize seems a very odd um, mm. thing to me, and, I'm, and I, un I guess I understand yeah. it in part, yeah. but I, so do you have anything to say about that? Well, it's great to see you again, and yeah. I also <laughs> think that um, I just think that what I thought was interesting in the connection I made with, with um, Anders and Sylvia is that they were, they were making the argument about creativity, and that it wasn't as much as they were trying to like neutralize them, in their mm. instance, and I, maybe they have bad marketing or bad branding, but they were trying to say you can be anything. Not you can to do impose anything. biases. Right. But I completely agree with you that we all have a spectrum of masculine to feminine inside of us, and we use them in different instances. But my big problem is it's the feminine side is just, as you say, is not valued in society, when in fact it's going to be the absolute key to the future. And that's, you know, that's the discussion I'm trying to have. Yeah. And in the work that I do, just to show you how we tie it together, it's an interdependence where you, you know, most women are very adept in masculine skills. We've had to learn to operate successfully in a foreign operating system of the masculine, and we've gotten really good at it. But, so we don't want to throw those out, but to bring the feminine forward, the feminine strengths like transparency, empathy, collaboration, intuition, and, and, and 
serve the feminine wisdom with the masculine so that the masculine gets up underneath our strategy, our follow through, our, our you know, being able to get up and get something done in support of what really matters. So there is, a, in my view, there is a way that they relate that's essentially you know, really important. Um, I, I was struck by the sort of dovetailing of the the feminine um, with, I, there, I don't know if you're familiar with all of this um, sort of hemispheric lateralization study of the brain mm. and, you know, the right versus yeah. left. But, you know, neuroscientists are finding that the right brain is our salvation. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've become such a, you know, a left brain dominant place. Um, there's a lot of evidence that we continue to move in that direction at the same time there's evidence to the contrary, and the brain is an elastic thing. And so everything that's happening out there is because of what's happening in here. I mean, it's the way we're, yeah. we're processing. It's the, there are different ways of seeing, and there is a feminine way of seeing that's qualitatively different. That's right. The left brain is what causes separation, whereas the right brain gives us the sense that we are all really connected, which yes. is sort of a higher view. And so we don't want to conflate the ego with masculine, but left brain, for sure, is the ego. And yes. the right brain, for sure, is our unitive consciousness or the feminine. But it is true that women have, you know, we are blessed with more neuronal connectors yes. in our corpus callosum. So yeah. we have an easier time accessing our right brains, yes. which, you know, gives us a tremendous responsibility as yes, well. Yes, it does. Responsibility. And, and in teaching and in um, sharing and in coaching and in supporting men to be able to understand more of what it, how it is we see things, instead of just buying that the way they see things is the way it should be. So that's that whole piece about standing up for what, how you see things. You know, just a, a quickie was, you know, when, out of Cheryl's book, which I'm just in the process of reading, there was this quick story yeah. she told about how until she got pregnant and had to lumber across the parking lot because she was late for a meeting and uh, there was no preferred parking for women that were pregnant, did she even come up with the thought that maybe there should be preferred parking for pregnant women? So she went in at the time working at Google, spoke to Sarah J, and within a few days it was instituted. So believing in whatever it is that you're perceiving as a woman as being right instead of questioning it and then taking it to places where you can make those changes is the kind of thing we're really supporting you in doing. That's how we'll change the systems. Uh, over here, yes. Uh, I, I want to start by just acknowledging you for your Athena gifts, and particularly as someone, a senior person at YNR, and connected with the ad business to use Athena principles and data and research in the way that you have. Uh, I think that's probably the reason that I decided I was just going to come and meet you, because you. I grew up in that industry, I, I mean around it, and very few people operate the way you do in that industry, and I just wanted to thank you for yes. modeling using that industry in an empowering way. Um, I don't know if any of you um, subscribe to Alternet. I've, I find it pretty interesting that there was an article, there's an article that's been on there the last couple of weeks about the 80 to 100 years of propaganda development that's happened through the last century, basically. And just to remind ourselves that, that our whole society, pro propaganda, totally enfolds all of us, and its basic function is to get you to question yourself and to install a negative self-image where, where the, f and the word you've used the most today, besides the sort of standard ones in your brand, is courage. Mm. And a person can't be courageous if they're questioning themselves. Mm. And that's why propaganda fundamentally undermines people's self-image so that you're always questioning yourself and you're questioning other people, and then you don't uh, in, engage your courage. Did you guys see the, um, at the TEDx Women this year on that point, there was this just awesome, yes. awesome TED talk of the, the, two young, the two young girls, the teenagers? Uh, right, mm. right. That got right. the magazines to get rid of um, falsifying um, images in, in the photographs. Oh, oh right. You remember right, that? Right. It was awesome. But the way they unpacked their story was so brilliant because they started all kind of perky and they're like, oh, we're like this. And by the end, it's like, we basically got all these magazines to like eliminate this forever. Wow. I mean, they were just totally kicked butt and they were both like 14. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> awesome. that's great. So the counterpoint to this is that actually today where you're talking about an emergent phenomenon, and I think it's fascinating you didn't do America 
because actually everything has been solved in America a thousand times, but the social environment doesn't allow it to propagate. So things that are going on overseas have actually been done here, but they have to be taken somewhere else <laughs> in order to actually propagate institutionally. In all the, uh, virtually every other country, it's easier than here because we don't see it because the propaganda thing is so mm -hmm. self-destructive uh, and self-doubting. So I think what's interesting is that the solutions will be gender neutral. Um, one example is uh, there's a program in this country called Safe School Ambassadors. Over a thousand schools have had Safe School Ambassadors. This program transforms the school every single time. It's yes. invented by a friend of mine out of Sebastopol. Right. And I'm, I'm working with him on this. But the, the thing about the bullying is that when they teach the six conflict de-escalation skills, it's completely gender, gender neutral. And the girls and the boys, all, each one has their own individual way of interrupting these negative self-images. That that's really what this is, a conflict is about, these negative self-images. So maybe the most important thing that any of us can do is actually affirm ourselves and affirm one another. And when we see people making a negative self-statement, which people do all the time, I mean, if you just listen to your friends, people, we're always doing this to ourselves. Just stop people from doing that. And then actually acknowledge their strength and, and where their courage can come from. Because, because that issue of courage is, is affecting all of us. That's awesome. really great. Yeah, love that. I love the, um, the Brene Brown shame video, uh, that she speaks directly to that in the video. Uh, um, it's, she's also done one on vulnerability, which has 4 million views, and one on shame that's newer, that has 2 million views. But she talks particularly about that. And, um, she tells a story where the teacher of her daughter said to the daughter, I know who your mother is just by how you act. And she said, well, how? She said, because when we told you that you were messy, you said, I make messes, but I'm not messy. <laughs> And so that whole idea of really owning your own story making and how you define yourself, that's actually part of the work that we do at um, Leading with Power and Grace. It's really about uh, defining who you are and being able to uh, create your identity from the essence of who you are, the highest part of you, rather than the history and the biographical self that you carry with you. And some people have been asking me over here and over here what my programs are. And I, I will just say that if you're interested, it happens to be quite a few of our advanced, we have level one people in the room who are taking the level one leading with power and grace. And there are level two people in the room. The level two people in the advanced, would you mind raising your hand if you're willing to talk to people about the program? Just raise your hand. Thank you. Mary, you are level two pretty much. <laughs> and Robin. So, so if people are interested in finding out more about our program, please feel free to talk to them. Or Susan Green, who's our senior coach for the program, if you're interested in executive coaching or want to know more about our programs, you can apply for the program that we'll be doing most likely either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And we're really happy to tell you about that. Really, uh, the essence of it is this integration in ourselves of the best of the masculine and the feminine and really uh, you know, learning how to lead your life with power and grace, how to have both of those things in full swing. My purpose in this, again, is to build this tribe. So if you will tell friends about it and, um, and you know, really um, spread the word so that our events keep going, and, and I want to know from you what you'd like to see more of next. So there's a Facebook group called TEDx Sand Hill Road Women that you're welcome to join. That's Facebook TEDx Sand Hill Road Women. And you'll get updates from us there, and you can give us input there. But spread the word and make sure to save the date in December for the TEDx uh, event that you'll be hearing about for us. And we may have one more of these events before the end of the year. We're feeling the, the appetite, so we're really wanting to do that. And so just before I close, I just want to really give a huge round of applause to John for coming all this way to speak. Remember that every, every one of you, can, you contributed to Girl Up today because you bought that, the, the ticket at which part of it went to um, the book, which part of it went to Girl Up. And so as you leave, you make sure to take a copy of the book and have John sign it if you'd like. He'll be sitting back there signing books. And then um, have coffee or hang around, and we'll be here for another hour or so.
Thank you.